Okay, welcome back for the second half of 120B, 220B, session three. Today, uh, we're talking about space planning stuff, and we kind of talked a little about how you lay out space and just create an overall budget. Let me give you just a couple more kind of pieces of feedback or things that are useful to think about as you're planning the spaces that are ultimately going to impact how we have to think about just providing services to the building, too. Because we have sort of our architectural needs and sort of how we want to create the connections. But a lot of what we do ends up coming down to the notion of just really how each space is occupied and ultimately how many people fit in each of those spaces or how many people our design code says we have to accommodate in each of those spaces. And that's where it gets to be sort of very interesting and tricky because choosing the right code versus choosing the wrong code can make all the difference between being incredibly conservatively over-designed and like uh, being very fine-tuned to the ultimate use of the building. Because the codes, the codes are a little, the boundaries between the code categories are a little bit confusing sometimes. And you want to make sure uh, you get the right one that comes together. The reason the whole notion of occupancy becomes very important to us is really as we think about the occupancy, um, that ultimately determines not only sort of how many people we have to assume are in the building so that as we think about them circulating or like moving out of the space in the emergency situation, okay, that all depends on the number of people and how we have to provide that. But also when it comes time to doing any sorts of planning for the mechanical systems, whether it's the water system or the ventilation system or the heating system, a lot of that is based on how many people we assume are in the building and what hours we're assuming they're in there. So if you put a lot of people in a building, it just consumes a lot more resource, uses a lot more energy, takes a lot more system to go ahead and provide that. So the allocation of like, you know, what you assume each of the different spaces is doing and like uh, what the occupancy is is really important. So amongst the many different resources that we'll look at, there's a few tables that are probably the most interesting and useful like uh, ones for us to take a look at. Um, a lot of the codes that are kind of currently in, or currently in use are part of the International Building Code, that's the IBC, and there are tables in the code that actually sort of explain like, uh, some of the different uses. Let me go ahead and go to this first reference, which is just a table. Actually, I think I may even have it out in the uh, Canvas site, so let me see if I have it out there. If I go to space planning, do I have there space planning? Nope, that's just my Revit documents in terms of doing that. Actually, that's just the egress part. Nope, okay, I'll go back. Let's see where I actually keep all this information. Copy that and take it over. Okay. There's definitions which sort of govern all this. For the most part, as we think about our buildings, our buildings being whether it's the museum spaces or it's spaces where a lot of people tend to congregate, they often fall into the assembly, assembly group. An assembly group is a civic, social, religious function, recreation, food or drink consumption, or waiting transportation. There's little subdivisions within there. Everything from motion picture halls and concert halls and theaters to banquet halls, nightclubs, art galleries, community halls, museums, funeral parlors. It's like pieces, places where people gather. That's distinguished from like single family residential or multi family residential, which tend to have more far fewer people. Or there's another category where things like hospitals and very high risk facilities are. Okay, and that's just a whole other category that has much more stringent requirements. So for the most part, you know, we're going to be different sorts of assembly categories, and that's what I'm going to show you that it's all sort of called out. And then within those assembly categories, there's actually tables that explain just really what you have to assume the occupancy is. So let me go back over and show you what that looks like. If I go to this table instead, see if I can get this. My system's a little screwy today. See that?
you'll find something called occupant load factors. And let's just talk about what those are. Occupant load factors are really, that's a notion of basically what, how many square feet you have to assume a person takes up. And the way to interpret all that is almost to think about doing the division. If you go through and, for example, provide a 500 square foot space, and you say that it is going to be used for an assembly with six, uh, without fixed seats, like concentrated or standing space. Let's say standing space, assembly without fixed seats, standing space. That'd be like a convention hall, something like that. People are standing around, milling around at a cocktail party or kind of at a trade show. You, know, you assume five net square feet per person, therefore you'd have to assume 100 people were in that space. The 100 people aren't going to be in that space all the time. There's going to be times when there's probably more than 100 people in that space. But as an average, you design everything as though it was five square foot per person. Okay? And there's just all sorts of different sort of interesting ways of looking at this. But for each of your different spaces, as you do your space planning spreadsheet, go ahead and think about really what the load factor is that's going to be relevant there. And that will tell you a little about how many people you have to consider as being in that space, really what your design factor is. So as we go moving on down through here, residential you see is, oh, about 200 square feet per person. So if you have a 1,000 square foot apartment or multifamily space, we assume that maybe five people could be in there. That's my phone. Um, if you were a mercantile space, okay, which is like more like uh, the shopping space or something like that, uh, at the grade level, interesting, we assume it's about 30 square feet per person. On other floors, we assume it's about 60 square feet per person. Think about that. It actually, if you think about most shops on the ground floor, a lot of people are wandering in and out, or if it's an upper floor, there's fewer people up there. So again, we would divide through by 30 per person and come up with the total amount of area. Educational, overall, we assume that it's somewhere around 20 uh, square foot per person. So if we take this space, which is approximately 20 by 40, that's 800 square feet, it's actually a little bit less in here, maybe 750 in this room, and you go through and you divide through by 20, and you'll get whatever the prescribed load is, so it's like 35 or something like that is what the load is that we have to consider for this room. So even though there are actually only 24 seats, well, plus the six over there, only 30 seats in here, more or less, we have to plan it for that load. And it all comes down to then, if all those people had to get out the door quickly because of an emergency, are we providing enough egress for them? OK, so let me think about that. We'll just go through for all these things. It's kind of interesting. Things that are like auditoriums and stuff like that that have fixed seats are actually very, very tight. Okay, whereas spaces like this where we don't have fixed seating, it's really much less because we have a little space for tables and chairs and all that kind of stuff. So it's interesting bowling centers. Or concentrated chairs only, not fixed, tables and chairs. I don't know. There's like all sorts of interesting stuff in that. But we'll go through and look at that specifically within your, uh, your building. Okay. So if I come back over, what I want to start getting you to think about, in addition to sort of overall the kind of amount of space and thinking about how many people are going to use those spaces, is really, is really how we lay out buildings oh, in order to uh, accommodate all those people. And in order to think about that, let me kind of give you the high level concepts that we're sort of driving by or uh, design, driving the design by, and then we'll think about really how it specifically applies to a building like the Y2E2 building. Okay, so in terms of egress, there are really a couple of different sort of main concepts we like to think about. So egress being, that is moving people, it's interesting, we have all the rules about just moving them through the building in general, up and down stairways and in elevators and stuff like that. But egress gets an awful lot of attention because that's the life safety kind of you know, critical point where we have to get it right. We have to kind of really get the egress right so that uh, you know, we can evacuate the building safely and we can use the emergency. Okay. There are three different parts to what an egress system. There's what's called the exit access, the exit itself, and then the exit discharge. So you have to basically get people to something which is considered an exit, 
and get them through the exit and back out the other end. Now, in terms of exit access, let's going to talk about that. Chances are, if your room is not immediately adjacent to a door going outside, you may have to go traveling down a hallway, or you may even have to travel through another room to get to the hallway. Often we have that kind of situation. We have several rooms. So from any point in the innermost office, say the most remote point, to the exit, and we'll talk about what the exit is in just a second, okay, you know, it's limited by code, and there's a distance that it can be at its maximum. So it could be a room leading to a hallway, it could be a hallway. Okay. What's considered to be the exit, though, is kind of interesting. The exit can either be that doorway that's going to the outside, or in the case of a multi-story building, it's just getting you to the stairway. If the stairway is enclosed in a way that's considered to be fire safe and it's considered a, a safe zone. So if we get you to the stairway, we're in pretty good shape. Okay, there's sort of a limit. It's roughly about either 200 linear feet if it's an unsprinkled building or 250 linear feet if it's a sprinkled building that we can use to get you to that, okay? but. If it's longer than that, we have to provide a second means of uh, exit. Okay. It's always good to have more than one means of exit, okay, just because there might be a pathway that's blocked, but we have to kind of get you towards the exit. Then we have the exit itself. Okay. Within the exit, that is not limited by code, interestingly. So once you're in that stairway, it doesn't matter whether you travel two stories or 100 stories. Okay, at least by code, that's considered the same. Because if the stairway is designed in a fire-safe way, you're considered to be in the safe zone. Okay, so we just have to get you to that safe zone. Okay, so you can have interior stairways, you can have exterior stairways, exterior passages, but basically we have to get you to some place where you're considered to be safe from whatever the uh, emergency is, typically fire, which we kind of design this around. So often around the stairway, there'll be some sort of uh, extra construction which makes it very fire resistant. Either can concrete or multiple layers of sheetrock so that there's a two hour barrier to separate so that there is a disaster. Once you're in there, you're actually fairly safe. Okay. Then you get to the exit discharge. Exit discharge is kind of an interesting thing. Often when you get down to the bottom of the stairs, you go zooming right out the building. In many cases, though, you don't exactly. For example, if you come down the blue stairway and hit the bottom over here, are you outside the building? You aren't, actually. So there's this other little path, which is considered part of the exit discharge. It has its own plain little requirements. And you'll see at the bases of the stairs, there's often these little chutes that divert you towards the outside that have to be locked off or anything like that to channel you out safely. Okay, as you're exiting, an important concept is the notion of direction of flow. It's this idea that as you move from the most remote spot to the point where we keep on aggregating people, in general, things tend to get larger and larger just because you have more and more people kind of cramming in there, okay, and you don't want them to get bottlenecks. Okay. Another important concept is this notion of alternative paths. The alternative paths is all about at any one spot, Okay. You'd like to have two options because if you happen to be having an exit path and there was a fire or some obstruction along the path, okay, you're sort of trapped behind that. So it's nice to always have branching so that you have the ability to go several different ways. Okay. Once you're in the protected zone, okay, at that point, you know, you should continue to remain to be protected. So once you're in there, if I bring you in a protected zone, I have to keep these discharge protected to you. I can't take you from a safe zone to a less safe zone. Okay, in terms of the travel length, let's take a look at that. That is this whole funny point about really how far you can go. Even this depends on the occupancies. You'll see for an A occupancy, assembly occupancy, Without fire sprinklers, it's 200 feet. Okay, with a fire sprinkler, it's 250 feet. Okay, so we have to get you to some sort of a safe egress within 250 feet. Now, sometimes people wonder, does this mean that, like, okay, 
do all stairways have to be like fully enclosed and fire safe? Because you go into a lot of buildings and they have these fantastic monumental staircases that aren't enclosed, they're kind of perfectly open and you know, just very much exposed to all the elements. If we're going to use that monumental stairway as part of the egress plan, from the most remote distance to the outside it can only be 250 feet or less. So if we are going to use that, uh, either the distance has to be very short or we have to provide other ways of getting to it too. There's nothing that says you can't have a monumental stairway, but you may have to have additional stairways that are, are protected to allow for that uh, like uh, protection when it's needed. There's all sorts of rules in there about the path itself. It has to be a clear, unobstructed path. And there's rules about the width. For example, it is not good to go ahead and have columns or things poking out into the hallway because if you were in a hurry and you know, just screaming madly, maybe the lights are out, maybe the thing is filled with smoke, you don't want to be running down the hallway and go kabunk into something like that. So we like to keep it a clear path. We have to make sure there's minimum distances in there. In terms of floor elevation changes, in general, we're not allowed to use the elevators, escalators, or any sort of moving walkway. Okay, it has to be accessible. If the power went out, you could still get out. Okay. If okay, there's a single step, the chances are we'll have to slope it. The problem with all the little single stairs, I'm not sure if you noticed, we used to have all these little homes where you step down a level or something like that, is people trip on those all the time. If you come on up and you're ready and you see 10 stairs in front of you, you're aware, you think, stare, your mind shifts into stairway mode and you sort of do the right thing because it's like a big enough uh, kind of hazard that you understand what you need to do. Single steps are really just a big problem. So to code today, we can't put like a single step or anything less than 12 inches because chances are you're going to trip on it. Okay, so often it has to be a little bit of a kind of slope. Ceiling height. Along the way, we can't go ahead and get any less than seven foot six. You can reduce it just a little bit. Seven foot six, that'd be eight inches. Never reach eight inches for protruding objects, no more than 50% of the area. So in general, it can't be really tall or really short. So uh, we have to be able to get you under there pretty comfortably. It used to be you'd say that that was a perfectly reasonable thing. I, I saw someone this weekend who must have been eight feet tall, and it just amazed me. <laughs> it's like, you know, you, you don't want people like that hitting their head. OK. Doorways are certainly a very interesting kind of issue. Let's talk about doorways. Have you noticed? On the front door to your home, which way does the door swing? Does it pull in or does it pull go out? When you walk out to the front door at your house, do you pull in or do you push out? Out. Out? That's interesting. That's right. That's uncommon. Do you, is it a private home or? It's an apartment. Oh, an apartment building. Ah, OK. How about for private homes? Can you picture your front door at home? The most common thing is you pull in, okay? However, in public buildings or in the case where we have, oh, more than 50 people might go out that door, then it has to go out. And the reason is if there were a fire and you were all pushing on that and the person in front couldn't pull the door open because hundreds of people were pushing behind them, people get stampeded. They get all caught in there and they can't get it open. So in general, we have to swing in the direction of the exit travel. Now, individual doors like this into our room, that's allowed to swing in, okay? But if there were more than 50 people, that would have to actually swing out instead. Okay, other things to know about doors. If you have a door and you have up to 49 people in the room, and remember I said on this room, 700 square feet, there are 35 people or something like that, okay? You only need one door. As soon as I cross the 50 people, I need two doors. Now, oddly, in this room, I've always held, I would feel much better if it was a second door, because I think that if I was over here and there was a fire, the chances of mine getting past all of you and getting out that door is pretty slim, because it's a lot of obstacles in here and stuff like that. But the rule is 
up to 50 at one door, 50 to 500. 500 is a lot. Think about an auditorium that has like 400 people in it. There could really only be two doors. Now, not to say that you should minimize your doors. You, it's OK to exceed the standards. Please do exceed the standards. That's what the minimum standard is. Three exits for up to 1,000 people. It's like that's, yeah, there's just rules. Quarter widths. There's all sorts of things about, you know, 0.3 inches per occupant. But more generally, these things tend to work out. There is a minimum width of a corridor. The minimum width has to be at least three inches more, or three feet better, 42 inches or three foot six. But depending on how many people are going through, you will understand whether it needs to be four feet or five feet or six feet. How thick do you think our corridor is out here? I always love this. In, uh, in the Y2E2 building, how thick do you, how wide do you think that corridor is? Five feet. It's somewhere in between. I'm trying to remember, I think it's six. It could be five. It's, it's less than you sort of think it is. How wide is the stairway when you come on down from the second floor and you're uh, coming on down and we're passing each other on the stairways as you go up the blue stairway? It's actually only about four foot six. It is. It's, it's really amazing. You know, somehow, three feet to the minimum, four foot six is enough that we can sort of pass each other and do a little dance. You know, eight feet is like the, you know, the grand stairway at the Paris Opera House or something like that. So you, know, you need a little bit of room, but not too awfully much. Okay, but all those things are really governed by the number of people coming on down them. Okay, but rather than kind of talking about it abstractly, let's just go ahead and I like to do this. Let's just think about the Y2E2 building. The Y2E2 building is kind of a fun one in terms of thinking about the building plans. We happen to have the building plans. And I'll ignore the basement level for just a second and go up to the first floor level. These are out there if you want to kind of take a look at them. Where did you go? There we go. Actually, I'm going to open that from the other tool. This one's going to bother me in just a second. Where free you go. Okay, let us think about this. This is the Y2E2 building right now. We'll see if you can spot all the uh, exits in here. So where are the exits to our building? Let's go ahead and start with those. So I'm going to go ahead and mark those in black. Anyone? Show me some, point out some exits to me. Well, I need more help than that. <laughs> Verbalize. Are they all the yellow? Um, Actually, they are sort of, yes. They're, they're sort of right there. There's one right here. There's actually one right here, right here. What else is going on? I actually have a little one right there. What else is floating around? If I go over to the other side, there's one right here. They're on this lobby area. Now this is actually two exits in the big lobby area. I bet if we looked at the code and the size of that lobby, we'd find there actually have to be quite a few doors in there. Okay, are there any classrooms that open directly to the outside? There actually is one, isn't there? Yeah, so it's got one right there. Okay, so what's that door all about? For the size of that room, which I think holds 65 or 66 people or something like that, you needed two exits. So they actually had to put one out there. One goes to the lobby, and one comes through right here. So there's a lot of exits in the building. What's that? What's that? There's no one like out of the confirmed kitchen also. Oh, you're right. But that's a whole separate little thing. But no, exactly. There's one over there, too. Looks like there's actually even one in back over here, in the back of this little mechanical room or something like that. But I'm usually I'm not very aware of that. OK, so let us think about this. We're in Y2184, a fire starts. We're heading towards the doors really quickly. So where are we going to go? All 
Okay, Britt, you're responsible for getting us out of here. Where are you taking us? Like down over here? Super. Okay. Hmm. What if there's a fire somewhere along here to there? Where are you going to take us next? <laughs> and where to? Uh, now where am I going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Okay. Go that way too. That way works too. Have you noticed, perchance, that in the hallway, it's kind of right about over there, there's a door which is almost always open, but if you're ever here to the fire, it'll swing shut and close. And there's actually a fire brick in here to sort of isolate the building a little bit. And that is, if there is some sort of fire which is detected in the building, let's see if I can find it in here. I think it's right there. Okay. It's just isolate this side of the building from that side of the building. So the problem is with so many of these things, there's a fire over here, and then there's a fire in the kitchen, and the smoke starts spilling out. Rather than kind of containing or filling up the entire building, we try to sort of subdivide and contain things. The little fire doors swing shut. They're, they're automatic? Yeah. So as soon as like the alarm goes off, it's actually kind of funny that you can hear it go clunk, clunk, and you feel like you're locked in for life or something like that. It's this really desperate sound. So no, they're there. There actually is a lot of them in the building in different sort of areas. So OK, let's go with that for a second. If you were coming down the stairway, let's say you were coming down that blue stairway, the blue stairway, so you know, you're already down there. Okay, chances are actually what happens with a blue stairway, the blue stairway is considered a fire safe zone. You see those really thick walls all the way around it? Okay, those doors close. That's considered a safe zone. In fact, this one over here is considered a safe zone too. See those doors on the front there? They'll close, as are these. Okay, but once we get you down to the bottom of that stairway, where are you supposed to go next? So I'm coming down, I'm here, where do I go? Okay, that door straight ahead of you has been closed off at this point. So what you're supposed to do is actually go out here and out like that. So what happens is there's actually a set of doors right here which close also, okay? And that's to create an exit discharge zone. Okay, same thing over here. If we come on down this stairway, we get to the bottom, you don't go out into the building this way, you're supposed to go out that way. So there's a set of doors and taking you to a little bit of an exit discharge zone. So what's kind of interesting about buildings overall is you still have a notion of how wide a building is, and really where the hallways are and what distances are. For example, if we were thinking about this building, like, oh, how wide is that building over there, or those offices on this side? What would you guesstimate they are? You ever been in those offices on that side? What are they? What's that? They're probably a little bit more. I would guess, i guess 12 to 14. Something like that in terms of the distance there. How wide is the stairway? Are they hallway? The hallway is somewhere around six. Okay. For our rooms here, we figured out that each of these is somewhere around 18 feet. So maybe it's about 36 feet here. There's probably another six foot hallway right here. Now, these offices on this side are really interesting. Do you have any idea why those offices face the way they do versus the other direction? It's kind of an interesting design choice. Why would you put all the offices on the north side of the building going longwise and all the buildings on the south side of the building going lengthwise? It has something to do with it being the south side of the building. What, what advantage do we gain by having kind of very narrow offices on the south side of the building? Or what do, they, what do the south side offices have that the north side offices don't? Direct south. Direct, exactly. So by putting the narrow offices over here, the idea is the direct sun that's coming in on the south side has not as far to travel to get into those hallways to actually like, give us a little bit of light inside here. 
So that's why they're all sort of narrow over here. It's really just that narrower width so we can bounce the sun across. So if you ever watch the woods open there, you know, there's really quite a bit of light that comes in on the little like polycarbonate panels up at the top. But overall, what this is starting to say is that as you think about buildings, oh, different sizes start to emerge. If it's 12 or 14 feet with a six foot hallway and 12 or 14 on the other side, if you have a building that has sort of a single hallway, it'll have some dimension. It'll be somewhere around 30 feet, maybe 36 feet, but much wider than that, and it gets hard to get light into the hallways. The rooms don't make much sense. That would be called like a, you know, if it was on a single side, that'd be a single load. This is called double load if you have two sides going to a hallway. This is actually more like a triple load where you have two hallways and three banks of offices. Or you can even say this is quad because you have two hallways with offices opening on both sides. But the way it works with our building, these center core spaces, okay, don't get very much light at all. But what is in the center core of our building? Okay, what sort of spaces did they put inside that very dark central core? So, what's, what's happening in there in that central space? Okay, are there many offices in there? See any offices in that space? Not usually. There's not very much in the way of office space. What are these spaces? Can you tell those are? Restrooms. Yeah, restrooms. Restrooms are considered to be good spaces to put on the inside. Natural light's not sort of a premium. They can kind of be on the dark. They sort of live on the core. In fact, there's another restroom down here, isn't there somewhere? There's another restroom right here. Super. What else is in here? We have the copy room. <laughs> okay, on both sides. We have the central sort of kitchen area in there, or the ever popular Y2184 classroom. <laughs> okay, which again, didn't need much light somehow in the scheme of things. So, or there's some kind of student office space in the center there. But as you think about organizing your building, just think about it in terms of there really are cores. Cores based upon who needed the sunlight, what made sense to sort of compact and put in there, kind of like uh, together. But you'll see that what's happening is you have stairway, stairway, kind of core spaces and offices on the outside. And just as you go thinking about your building, I just want you to start being aware that when we sit down and meet with you individually and talk about how you lay out your spaces, we'll kind of look for the same not exactly this order, it doesn't have to be this order, but there's always an order to it in terms of you know, where you put restrooms and hallways, where you put the kind of spaces which don't need the sunlight, where you put the spaces that do need the sunlight and benefit from the sunlight. And a little bit of organizing goes a long way. A nice thing about this whole layout relative to keeping the core spaces is in here is that the whole notion of where all the mechanical stuff is, what all the rooms which are on the inside have mechanical heating and cooling, where the spaces on the outside they have natural heating and cooling. Um, the plumbing is all towards the inside versus the outside spaces don't have any plumbing. There's a lot of organization that went into that. So it's not strictly arbitrary. A lot of stuff sort of makes sense. Even in here, this sounds really kind of dumb, but at some level, the whole notion that that little closet, which is the Koopa kitchen, and the restrooms being right in that same little space is, there's an efficiency to that. You know, they don't really face each other, but from a plumbing standpoint, that made a lot of space. Whereas these big sort of public classrooms, they were off the central lobby, or from the faculty offices were over here. Yeah, so anyway, we'll continue to come back to YTE2 as an example, but as you think about it, just be aware of where your exits are gonna be, where your stairways are gonna be, and your core spaces, because when we sit down and look at your buildings, We'll kind of look at it that way. At some level, if we get the skeleton of all those spaces in the right places, the individual shapes of the rooms doesn't matter so much. We sort of have to get them in the right general locations, and the building will hang together right. Okay? Beauty. Okay. Let us adjourn for the day. What I'm going to do is actually um, post on Canvas sometimes. We'll get an invitation to sign up for an individual time to come, come visit with Alana and I. And if you're just getting started, no worries. You know, you can sign up for a later time. If you already have an idea, like you do already, you have a sketch already of what you have in mind, come on in, let's just talk about it, and we'll just sketch together. We kind of see about, uh, yeah, just 
you know, getting you kicked off and moving in the right direction. Okay? Beauty. Let us adjourn. <laughs>